appears that that's working. So let's kick it off here. Hold on a minute. All right, now you should see my full screen there. Yep. Oh, fantastic. Okay, well, I definitely want to welcome everybody to the very important 9-11, September 11th meeting here of the Freedom Hub Working Group. We have a really exciting episode today. Uh, we've got on the site here a couple of the links for us to uh, let you take a look at. In fact, we've got an error. I have to fix this one here. I see right now. I'm going to restart this. Oh, shoot. Okay, we're going to just go. All right. This is our welcome everybody to the 9-11 episode of the Freedom Hub Working Group. I'm showing here at the beginning the web links to be able to participate. This first one, which is case sensitive, is how you join to be a participant in this on a regular basis. All these videos are recorded and they're posted on our channel on Brighteon, which is the bit.ly that you see here too, also case sensitive, the Freedom Hub channel. And then the whole program is being sponsored by your Freedom Hub, which is your chance to connect with all the different tools and services related to your health and your wealth for some of the uh, you know, disruption that's taking place out there. There's some great place to participate. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now let's do a quick preview before we get going on today's guest. If you'll do the honors here, Charles. Great, Jeff, and I assume you hear me. Uh, next week we have another Competitive Enterprise Institute scholar, Mark Scribner, talking about a topic, uh, airports that we covered a month ago with uh, Bob Poole from Reason Foundation. And this gets to the question that I think a lot of folks ask when you drive by that really nice fancy airport of a smaller scale, regional, and you're wondering why is that so underused? Well, there's a lot of government reasons, as we're not surprised to hear, and Mark will talk about those. Uh, log jammed busy big airports and ignored <coughs> mid-sized re mid regional airports. A couple of weeks from now, we'll have the well-known Donald Boudreaux, Econ Department Chair at George Mason University, attack labor laws that really screw workers. We want to have better jobs following our passions, as John Tamney talked about from Forbes a couple weeks ago, well, we had to look at labor laws. In three weeks, we'll have David Thoreau, the president and founder of the Independent Institute, talking about his think tank and all their scholars and work. And a month from now, we're gonna to get to the cool issue of environmentalism from a free market standpoint with Todd Meyer from the Washington Policy Center. Jeff, that is your preview. That sounds fantastic. I appreciate that. And then let's start rolling into today here a little bit. So on that note, we're going to find out a little bit about John. So why don't you do the honors as well? Okay. And while I do that, Jeff, uh, let's explore the mute button for guests if we can for some yeah. background noise. I, there is and some. If, if folks can mute yourself, that's also something you can do to help us uh, hear what's being said. Uh, John Whitehead is the... Uh, is channels James Madison, as famed civil libertarian Nat Hentoff is quoted as saying. Uh, he is going to talk about the lost liberties since 9-11, uh, that fateful terrorism day in 2001. And he is the founder of the Rutherford Institute, located near me in Virginia, here in Charlottesville. He has co-counseled cases in the Supreme Court, and he is the author of a couple books at least, that we'll highlight today. One is Battlefield America, The War on the American People, and Government of Wolves, The Emerging American Police State. And you can find him in different news aggregator sites, really just slamming all the detailed ways that we've lost our liberty. So no one is better than him to talk about this topic, Jeff. Fantastic. Well, John, I'm gonna turn the floor over to you. Oh, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I've been working in this area for about 40 years. In fact, uh, I've written over 30 books, some that you will see on your screen, obviously. And um, I started writing on the NSA uh, back in the 1980s when I saw that they were listening on people's phone calls. And that was back in the 1980s, the book called The End of Man. 
uh, where I actually was, uh, people were saying, no, nah, you're crazy. That's not true. But since things have, uh, 9-11 obviously is the key turning point. That's the uh, point at which uh, the country uh, started progressively going very speedily along the track of totalitarianism, which is where we're at today. It's, uh, uh, as, as I was showing some of the things that I'll be talking about, uh, we are a different country since 9-11, obviously. If you lived in the country before then and you were half awake, you would see that. But uh, the, there's all kinds of warnings from the past and the great uh, writers like Philip K. Dick, Alex Huxley, Orwell, all, all predicted where we were headed, mainly because uh, people tend to slide into uh, totalitarian states quite easily sometimes, and then they look around and go, what in the heck happened? Why am I here? Because they trust the government. James Madison, who wrote the Bill of Rights, said, we ought to mistrust all those in power and I t always say that that's the basic principle. If, you're a, if you call yourself a freedom fighter or a patriot, that's your first principle. If you trust the government, then you're being incredibly silly. Uh, so as I will show you, know, we, there was a 2014, 2014 study by Princeton University, which looked at uh, 1,800 policies and laws passed in Washington, D.C. from 1981 to 2002. And they came to the conclusion that we live in a moneyed elite, which they called an oligarchy, run by basically those in power, which has been estimated there are 585 billionaires basically that call most of the shots at what you see in government in this country. And um, what we want to, we've heard the, uh, the deep state, which I was one of the first, by the way, to write on the deep state and that memo that was attained from the FBI about this seventh floor group that uh, is a, a conglomerate of folks, basically, um, and I'm postulating here, corporate leaders, I mean, you're talking about the billionaires, the people running the show, Google, Facebook now, and uh, the people supposedly in powers of government, the military, the CIA, and NSA. And uh, this is not just coming from me, by the way. I've talked to a number of NSA, former NSA agents, and some still working FBI agents who tell me the same thing. John, it's worse than you think. And uh, so what we're seeing here is that the government that we call a democracy or republic, in my opinion, doesn't really exist anymore in the true sense of the word. Uh, and to give you an example, uh, there, there are private groups that write all the laws, basically, of which 2000 re, uh, in the last couple of years have been passed by Congress. These are private groups that corporate uh, enterprises, money people who are writing everything. And so we... We, the people, and people always ask me, who is the, responsible for this? Who is responsible for this is we, the people. We, the people, have let this happen. Remember those three words that begin the Constitution. We, the people, says we are the government. We are the government. If we are the government, then what in the heck are, are we watching and allowing to happen? And one reason we're seeing a, a lot of this, and I'll be telling you why it's rapidly moving is, is that since 9-11, the government has fused with the corporate entities. We live in a corporate state now. And um, we move from what I would call an organic environment into an artificial environment, where AI, artificial intelligence now, is basically dictating what's happening, around, uh, especially in the United States, but more so around the world in places like China as well. And as we talk about that, we see that Google, Facebook and all the big groups work with the Chinese government, which, which uh, by the way, as, as most of you probably know, uh, places social credit scores on people. They can't travel. They can't do here. Can't go to restaurants or whatever. If they're not friendly folks, if they're doing something wrong money wise or freedom wise or opposing the government, we're seeing the same things happen here, especially since 9-11. We have threat assessments now. The Department of Homeland Security is conducting threat assessments on homes across America Supposedly, every home in America now has a threat assessment. It goes from green to red. There are five different colors, with yellow being in the middle. If you own a weapon, you're automatically a red, uh, which moves to how police react when they come to people's doors these days in so-called knock-and-talk sessions. If you haven't seen any of these, I'd say go to our website. I've written on knock-and-talk. The 80,000 SWAT team raids that are occurring across America, up from 3,000 in the 1980s. 80,000 annually now, and that's growing. 80% of those SWAT team raids are for a mere warrant service, where a policeman used to come to your door and knock on your door and hand you a warrant. 
Now in the middle of the night, they're crashing through people's doors, shooting up to 500 dogs a day, uh, kids getting hurt, killed, and uh, citizens getting killed in these raids. And many times, sorry folks, but they're in the wrong home. Uh, so we're living in a more militarized uh, component now, which we call our government, which basically runs everything. And I'll get a little more into that in a minute. But the key thing here is how they control us is by watching everything we're doing. And everything we're doing is being watched. I know right now that there's some NSA boys. And I got, it was funny. I, an NSA guy talked to me a couple years ago. And, and, and I said, you know, I write a column. He said, oh, yeah, man, we all read it every morning. <laughs> and I went, well, you do? He said, yeah, we check your website. It's one of the ones we focus on. Uh, they're watching everything we're doing, but you don't have to be me to be watched. I mean, the NSA is collecting about 2 billion uh, emails daily, uh, text messages, Facebook pages are downloaded. Uh, the NSA, believe it, uh, co collected 534 million records of Americans' phone calls in 2014. That number increased 151 million in 2016 to almost 700 million phone calls that they're recording, and if, if you move forward a little bit, that's probably about a million now, I mean, a, a trillion now. They're watching everything we're doing, a billion phone calls, I'm sorry. So they're watching everything we're doing. They're recording it. And the reason they're doing it is that we have a very paranoid government. And I would go to our website, I've written about this. There's a video that the uh, Pentagon put out. It's called Mega Cities: Urban Future, the Emerging Complexity. It's a Pentagon training video create, created by the Army for supposedly for the U.S. Special Operations Command. If you watch that video, it's a little over five minutes. It's uh, actually directed by a Hollywood director who remains anonymous. It looks like Spielberg to me, but it may be somebody else. But it actually is predicting that by 2030, this country is going to collapse financially and otherwise. And uh, with what we're seeing today, uh, that may very well be true. You have 75,000 stores that may be closing by 2026, economists say. Our farmlands being bought up by foreign entities. 30 million acres of American farmland, farmland now are owned by foreign investors. This has doubled in the, the past 20 years. Um, the country, this country is not what it used to be. This is not the country of, the, of we the people. This is the country of we the foreigners that have come into our country and are, and are investing with little, with and I, I know most of you probably not have heard of this, but the point is they're not going to tell you that. The, the President of the United States, the Congress, flying overseas, meeting with all these people, they're not telling you that they are erecting uh, what I would see a global co complex. The NSA, by the way, has their Five Eyes program where they have uh, total surveillance base, bases spread around the country, and they work with 17 other countries, by the way, worldwide to set up a global surveillance state. That's already in effect. I have people who tell me, they say, well, I got to get out of this country. I think it's going batty. And I tell them, listen, dude, if you've got a phone, a cell phone or a laptop, you're going to be watched. And even then, you're, if you don't have that, with the drones circling all over the place, the blimps that are flying across the United States by the Pentagon, mapping everything, watching us, the development of facial recognition software. So they know wherever you're moving, whatever you're doing, it's only going to get worse as they increase their power. And... Again, like I'm saying, you're dealing with a paranoid government that wants to put down any kind of, let's say, rebellion that might have some violence contact, uh, connected to it. I mean, how many of you know that in 2009, under the Obama administration, the Department of Homeland Security actually put out uh, some memos, right-wing extremism and left-wing extremism, where they looked at who they considered to be the extremist in America. It was animal rights activists were listed. <laughs> Returning veterans automatically could be suspected terrorists. Then there's the third program that, that came out under Obama, which was Operation Vigilant Eagle, where they watch every returning veteran from overseas. I'm a former Army veteran. That is repugnant to me. I talked to Army veterans today, uh, Air Force pilot, by the way, who flew fighter jets. When he left the Army, he had a five-minute examination, he said, he was labeled with PSTD, but it was okay for over there, but he can't own a weapon over here. He met with me. He was shocked. He was upset. He said, I could bomb people, but I can't own a hunting rifle in America. And there again, they are watching people. 
Go to our website, by the way, and read the case of Brandon Robb, who was under Operation Vigilant Eagle, was arrested. He was a 26-year-old Marine. This has happened about four years ago. We defended him. He was a 26-year-old Marine who was jogging on a Saturday morning in his shorts. He came back to his home and was typing on his typewriter. He had a home business. He heard noises outside. He heard vehicles pulling up. He went to his front door and looked out. Uh, police running toward his home and then people running toward his home in black suits with white shirts and black ties who later basically said they were the D Department of Homeland Security and FBI. And he opened the door, screen door. He did not own a weapon, by the way. They knew this. He said the most dangerous thing in this house was his parry knife. Well, he opened the door and the police and the FBI agent stepped up and said, we're concerned about your Facebook post. He was attacking Obama, saying Obama's uh, executive orders were treason. Obama should be arrested and put in jail. He was playing a, a private Facebook game called Dear Mr. Illuminati. They actually had downloaded and watched that. This is how effective they can be. And uh, again, they were watching everything he was doing. He is a 9-11 conspiracy theorist, believe it or not. This is appropriate to talk about it on this day. He believes the government uh, actually uh, engineered 9-11. Uh, he was immediately, he stepped, they asked him to step out. He did. They arrested him, threw him against the fence, butted his back, took him to a, to a, a local jail near Richmond, Virginia, where he was given a five-minute examination by a psychiatrist who said because he was a 9-11 conspiracy theorist, that he had mental issues and should be uh, put in the mental hospital. Thereafter, he had a short hearing before a magistrate and was placed in a mental hospital. Those are called civil commitments. In Virginia alone, there are 20,000 annually that occur where people disappear into mental hospitals in America today. And it's estimated about 1.5 million annually across the United States. If that doesn't freak you out, nothing shouldn't freak you out. But anyway, we filed a lawsuit. The judge looked at all the facts and came to the conclusion he should have never have been there in the first place. We got him out of jail. Uh, we were the only group that was defending, by the way. Everybody's nervous about these civil commitments. But when I looked at the facts and talked to his mother, who was weeping, she had contacted the ACLU and all these groups. They said, we can't touch this. I said, well, I'm going to help this guy. We helped him. Got him out and uh, filed a lawsuit against all the cops and stuff against, and the, the federal courts ruled they had qualified immunity, which is exactly every, basically every policeman who enters into anything today uh, and commits a crime, even shoots people, they have qualified immunity. They don't serve any kind of time, basically. So they're out there doing what they want to do, but if we accidentally shoot somebody in the toe, we're definitely gonna to go to jail. And so what I'm saying is, this is paranoia when you're looking at people like that. And people say we have free speech in America. Well, you better watch it. You think you have super free speech in America, uh, they're watching. If you say, I've had uh, a veteran contact with you long, too, not too long ago, and he said, I've got my gun and I'm ready. I immediately emailed him back and said, you're insane for saying that on Facebook. You, your threat assessment's now gone to red. You can get arrested. Uh, and I see it all the time. A former Vietnam War veteran, decorated veteran, uh, Vietnam War, uh, was criticizing a few people through emails. Nothing, you just didn't like the way they were doing the uh, so-called military exercises that they're doing on, on American soil today where you have the military fighting against domestic entities or enemies, which are the American people. Uh, the next day, he, he uh, got a knock on the door. Two NSA agents showed up. They had guns on their sides. They said if he did any more of that kind of texting, they were going to arrest him and send him out of the country. He came into my office just destitute. And we, you know, again, we wrote a letter to the, it, it, it outed them and we said, you touch this guy, you're going to be face a big lawsuit and some bad publicity. And they didn't do anything. But what I'm saying is, this is a, a, a government that sees we, the people, basically not as real entities that deserve freedom and want to fight for freedom. They see us as basically enemies. And again, the term conspiracy theorists, people say, what do you think of conspiracy theorists? Well, conspiracy theorist is anybody that disagrees with the government. That's basically it, whether you raise it or not. And they're arming their agents, by the way, with amazing, again, if you look at local police today, the Department of Homeland Security is handing out free uh, assault weapons, vests, helmets, uh, armor, MRAPs, which are basically tanks on tires, uh, grenade launchers, 
communities small as 5,000 people have all this kind of weird equipment. Uh, under Trump, uh, DSA, DHA, DHS agents have now five more bullets than they had before he became president. But here's the key. Uh, they have so many darn bullets, <laughs> that just one agency, you could not rebel. There's 175 federal agents running around now with SWAT team gear in this country. Uh, so you, people ask me, when, could, could we go into martial law? Looking at what I see today, and I see a lot of policemen now dressed in camouflage outfits, you're talking again to a former infantry officer. That's the military. I see local police, they look like the military. And uh, they've actually bought Department of Homeland Security hollow point bullets. They actually got a contract and had them specially made for them through the ATA Corporation. Hollow point bullets expand on contact, will blow your arm off. Martin Luther King, John, John F. Kennedy all got shot in the head with uh, hollow point bullets. And some people think it was by the government. They'll definitely kill you down. But uh, they just, uh, just regular, what you'd say, peaceful agencies in the so-called federal government have enough arms to blow away some of the biggest countries in the world. The Department of Homeland Security has 1,600 rounds per agent. The Department of Agriculture, listen to this, has 320,000 hollow point bullets. The Social Security Administration with their troops, now the word troops is the correct way to say it, they have 200,000 hollow point bullets. Uh, I mean, you're talking about the Smithsonian Institution having hollow point bullets and agents. What in the world? The IRS, S, IRS has all these hollow point bullets and thousands of guns and stuff and agents running, running around the country. So the question is, if you happen to be a group that disagrees with the government and says, hey, we want our militia to fight back, like it says in the Second Amendment, you're going to get arrested before you ever get there. Uh, so... What I'm saying again, we moved into an artificial environment where everything we're doing, Facebook, and people, by the way, are submitting to it, which is a shocking thing to me when I see how people just basically say, okay, we'll put up with it. And I get the question all the time, well, if I've done nothing wrong, why should I worry that they watch everything I do? Well, there's a several one. One is you just, if you use the word bomb, by the way, that movie bomb, you can get arrested today. Uh, number two is we have a customer.